So I'm just going to take 10 minutes or so just to give a little bit of an overview of our wilder strategy and how we're doing. And it's four years now since we launched our strategy in 2019. Uh, been rather an interesting year with COVID and various other things. But despite all of that, we have made excellent progress in the first four years. So just a very quick recap of the kind of main points of our strategy. And I think the first thing to really emphasise is that it was a real step up in ambition. In recognition of the nature and climate crisis, we knew we needed to step up uh, and do more. And also call, put a call out, a call for action for other people to step up and do things with us to do as much as we can locally to put nature into recovery. And to tip the balance for nature, we know that we need one in four people to come forward and act for nature with us, either with us, for us, or independently, as part of a big family that we call Team Wilder, which is all sorts of different people doing amazing things for nature. And we also are calling for 30% of land and sea to be in recovery for nature by 2030. And that is the 30 by 30 that you'll hear. You've, David mentioned earlier, and I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, and on top of that 30%, we also need to see the other 70%, the wider countryside, managed more sustainably with those pressures reduced, things like pollution in our rivers, for example. Um, and that's a really important additional part of our overall goal. So here are our goals just summarised, that nature recovery, that 30 by 30, people taking action, that one in four people stepping up, and the nature-based solutions, which is really the way that we're going to try and reduce the pressure on the wider environment, reduce pollution, try and tackle climate change through nature restoration, and work with partners uh, to really benefit uh, society through nature recovery. And you'll hear more about that shortly as well. So for those geeks in the room, uh, Megan's a geek, I'm a geek, and I'm sure everybody else has got at least an element of geek. If you want to know, uh, if you want to look up key references, you know, where did 30 by 30 come from? We didn't just make it up. This is now a global target that 188 countries actually signed up to as part of the Montreal uh, COP15 last year. They've signed up to this 30 by 30 global commitment to bring 30% of land and sea into good management by 2030. And notably, at Montreal, signatories also agreed to reduce by half uh, excess nutrient pollution and also the risk posed by pesticides in the wider environment. So they're pretty big commitments and we need to remember to hold our governments to account on those because they have signed up to that. Um, on the one in four, that's based on really good social science and lots of evidence uh, that that tipping point in society will occur if we can get that 25% of people or one in four people acting. So there's good social science behind that one. And nature-based solutions are also now globally recognised as really critical to help us not only tackle climate change, but also deal with a host of other issues. So it's not just stuff we've made up. This is very much us adopting these widely accepted principles now. And of course, all of this is more important than ever. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the latest State, State of Nature report came out, and sadly, it is green reading, so I don't want to depress you too much, but unfortunately, nature is still declining, despite all of our fantastic work and the promises and the strategies and the plans that we all know about, unfortunately, it is still declining. Um, and from one in 10 species at risk, last time the report came out, it's now one in six. That is not good. And species from all groups, mammals, birds, insects and plants continue to decline. The causes of that decline are absolutely clear, mainly intensive agriculture and climate change now is coming in as one of the other really big causes of those declines. But the good news is that we know conservation works. It does work. It can work. There are many, many examples of nature recovery and nature restoration successfully bringing wildlife back. We know what to do. We just need more space in which to do it. And as a trust, as you know, we've got decades of experience doing this. 
Our nature reserves are incredible. In fact, they are the places really where most of the wildlife that remains is. You know, if you drive around Hampshire or the Isle of Wight, if you want to see clouds of butterflies, meadows full of wildflowers, you've got to go to a nature reserve because they're not in the wider countryside anymore. So they're absolutely critical and they're wonderful places, um, packed with diversity and abundance. You know, they lift our spirits. They're fantastically important. And we're working hard to absolutely maximise the biodiversity value of our reserves. But it is only 2% of our two counties. So they are too small, they are too isolated, and they are impacted by what goes on all around them. Often they're hemmed in by development. They can be polluted or impacted by runoff, nutrients or other chemicals. And they can also be damaged by too much recreational pressure. So we know they're not enough. Hence our 30 by 30 strategy. That 30 by 30 is absolutely a critical mission that we must focus on relentlessly. But I'm just going to spend a few minutes defining what it means. Because although people talk about it, I have yet to see anybody actually define it properly and actually put any numbers on it. So this is my back of an envelope. Now take this with an element of, it's got a, a health warning on it. This is not official. Uh, Hannah will talk shortly about the local nature recovery strategy. <clears throat> and in that, we hope that this will be properly defined and agreed by all the partners. So it's not yet agreed. This is my back of an envelope. But we know the extent of the current protected sites network in Hampshire. We know that it's about 13% of land that's currently either protected or nature reserves. So we can roughly work out that to get to 30%, we need somewhere in the region of 60 to 70,000 hectares of new land. That is a lot. I think it's really important to put a number on it because otherwise everybody just talks about it as an abstract concept. But once you have a number on something, it starts to really concentrate the mind. So that's quite a big challenge. Um, but at the Trust, what we've done is we've thought very long and hard about what can we contribute to that target. <clears throat> we've set ourselves two targets in our strategy. So one is to acquire 1,000 hectares. So buy that land as the Trust, add that to our portfolio and create new nature reserves. So 1,000 hectares acquired and 5,000 hectares restored working with partners. So that would make mean that the trust would contribute about 8% to that overall nature recovery target, which I think, you know, for a charity is a pretty reasonable contribution. And we hope by doing that, we will encourage other partners, the local authorities, the national parks, etc., to come forward with their own offer What's your offer? What are you going to bring to the party? So let's hope we can uh, uh, lead the way and get others to contribute as well. So a little bit more detail then about our land acquisition target. So that 1,000 hectares between 2020 and 2030. So it's really important that we focus on that. And although I did just say our nature reserves are too small uh, and very isolated, it's still absolutely critical that we continue to acquire land because not only for its own sake, it also gives us influence. We can use our sites for advocacy purposes. And we can also make sure that our strategic acquisitions gradually over time start to build a wilder landscape. In the first three years of our strategy, we've acquired 300 hectares. So we're bang on target, which is great news. So in terms of our strategic approach to acquisitions, we are trying to build those bigger, better, more joined up wilder landscapes, following the principles of uh, the Lawton Report, which some of you might remember. So I'm just going to run through a very quick animation, which I love this. So I hope you love it as well. This shows our approach in just one place, the Isle of Wight. We want to replicate this everywhere. But just to sort of run through, so here's where we're located, East Wight. Back in 2009, we had these three little sites. And this was classic, typical nature reserves, little sites, very isolated, fantastically important, but on their own, quite isolated. And then gradually, over years, we've started to add to our estate on the island. So in 2010, we acquired uh, K. Knight and Down. Then we gradually added 2011, 2012, Sandown Meadows. This site was bought with a very generous legacy 
uh, Kathleen Cooper, uh, and gradually over time we've been we were gifted Martin's Wood, and then we acquired Alveston Mead, then we acquired Morton Marsh. This is all of the Eastern Yarl Valley. We're trying to join up wetlands here and create this bigger landscape. Then we were able to acquire New Church Moors. And I know that some of you in this room were very generous with your donations when we did the appeal for that, so thank you. Then we acquired some other extra extensions. Then the big one, Ducksmoor in 2020. And then the even bigger one, Lumwell uh, in 2022. And then we've just acquired uh, an extension to Swan Pond and Casey Knox Meadow. So I hope you can really see that strategic investment, trying to build that wild, wilder landscape, joining dots, joining up these fragmented pieces. So eventually we've got this really big, much more functional landscape that will really you know, be so much better for nature and so much more resilient to external pressures. I love that. That's great, isn't it? Um, our second target, the 5,000 hectares, is to work with partners to restore and rewild uh, land across the two counties. And in April, it's not in the annual report because it just missed the end of the year, but in April we launched the Rewilding Network. We've had a quite a few landowners come forward already. Um, some we've been working with for years, like the inspirational Harvey Jones, pictured here, who's transforming his two estates at Binfield and South Holt into incredible wildlife havens. Uh, new partners include Mandy Lou at Ewhurst Park, another estate going through a transformation into an edible landscape complete with beavers and a community market garden. Numwell Home Farm, who are neighbours and partners at Wild and Numwell. New entrant farmers who are leading the charge uh, to create a regenerative farming revolution on the Isle of Wight. And the Lockerley Estate, and somebody mentioned Broughton Down earlier, there are neighbours at Broughton Down, part of the Sainsbury's family, who are now uh, embedding a regenerative approach across the arable farm and rewilding 82 hectares of their land, including this amazing green hay, uh, chalk grass and restoration um, involving green hay spreading from Broughton Down, which is adjacent. Overall, in the last sort of three or four years, we think there's about 1,200 hectares that have come forward through various partnerships, which is absolutely fantastic. So I'm just going to very quickly uh, just bust a couple of myths about food security because this comes up a lot. A lot of people worry that we're taking farms out of production and we're rewilding those farms. What I would say to that is that it's a bit of a myth really um, because for nature to recover it does need more space. There's no question that nature needs bigger, larger areas. Wild nature cannot thrive in just a few buffer strips or bits of land on the fringes of farming. But, so that does mean that some land will have to come out uh, of production. However, if we change the way we farm, there is still plenty of land to produce the food that we need. And in fact, climate change and biodiversity loss are at threats to food security. And I think that's a really important point to make. And the latest DEFRA report last year said that those threats would, be, would cause potentially at least one 0.2 billion pounds worth of loss due to loss of soil capacity, uh, fertility and loss of biodiversity. So I think it's really important to work with farmers to you know, really push forward on this regenerative way of farming and bust some of those myths because we're only looking at rewilding and restoring a small proportion of our farmland, not all of it. And by focusing that work on floodplains and other areas that are less productive, we can actually boost food security uh, as well as ecological security. And it's a win-win as well, because with climate change being the biggest threat to food security, if we restore more nature, we're really helping to tackle the climate crisis. It could be a real win-win. And the powers of nature, particularly wetlands, in capturing and storing huge amounts of carbon from the atmosphere is an incredibly powerful tool for us in the, in the fight against climate change. And some of the statistics that, you know, if you're looking at trying to get to those net zero about a third of those emissions reductions could be achieved through nature-based solutions, through some of the work that we already do. But I honestly don't think this message is quite getting through yet by decision makers. They seem fixated on things like tree planting, um, this sort of tokenistic approach is rather than investing in ecosystem restoration. So we do need to work much harder to change that mindset. 
And finally, I just want to come back to species. Ecosystems are not just about habitats. They have to have all of the different components, all of the different species, plants, fungi, insects and animals, all living within those ecosystems to make sure that they function. So we do still focus a lot on rare species from boosting butterfly numbers, including our marsh artillery restoration, uh, uh, reintroduction that we did a few years ago, and boosting the numbers of Duke of Burgundy on some of our reserves. You know, it's really important work. And of course, our crayfish work, um, which is trying to save the endangered white claw crayfish from extinction, which is a real uh, kind of chalk stream specialist and something we're very lucky to have still in our, in our rivers here in Hampshire. So without further ado, I will show a short film of our crayfish project. And Megan and I were really lucky. We managed to have a day out with the team, got our waders on, we got in the chalk stream, uh, and we were really lucky to find some of those, some of those females with the eggs um, that Ben will tell you all about now. So thank you very much indeed. I will just play the film for you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ben Rushbrook, Principal Ecologist at Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. So I work on the Southern Chalk Stream project. Chalk streams are a globally rare habitat. In England, we support about 85% of that habitat across the world. And the chalk stream work that we do is looking at promoting, protecting and preserving the really important chalk stream um, invertebrate communities that these habitats support. They're also really valuable for monitoring the health of our chalk rivers. Um, being such a critical part and being sensitive to a range of the threats such as pollution, siltation, habitat degradation or, or perhaps invasive non-native species. Because invertebrates are sensitive to these pressures, they're really good for monitoring the health of our chalk rivers. A key part of the Southern Chalking Project is promoting, protecting, preserving our white claw crayfish populations. My name is Tom Selby. I am an assistant ecologist at Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. The primary uh, threat to white claw crayfish are non-native invasive uh, crayfish species, um, such as the signal crayfish, which outcompete the native crayfish. They also carry a disease known as crayfish plague, which is up to 100% fatal to the native crayfish if the crayfish plague spores get into a white claw crayfish population. We've been working with the Bristol Zoological Society on a program of captive rearing and captive breeding of white clawed crayfish. This spring, we did our annual collection of buried females from the top of the Itchin. I'm Jo Gore, and I'm an ecologist at Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. So it was a real privilege to be involved with the collection. We put the traps out uh, two weeks previously, which involves um, putting some artificial refuge traps and then returned two weeks later uh, with the team to check the traps and we were really lucky. I think we put 40 traps out and we got a good handful of buried females. So what we do on that day is we collect females that are holding the eggs so they will mate in the October or the November before uh, and then those females will generally hold those eggs till late spring and summer. So we go in early spring and we look to collect those females with the eggs and then we take them back to Bristol Zoo where they will allow those uh, females to continue to hold those eggs until they're ready to hatch and the juveniles be released. Buried female collection days are always an exciting day to see how many crayfish with eggs we can find. But since these collections uh, usually take place in April, the water can be cold, um, particularly when we're um, hand searching in the river for crayfish, but it's all worthwhile. I'm Matt Tennant and I'm an ecologist for the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. Uh, it was a really good experience for me. I got to work with Debbie and Megan and had a really good day. For me, it was really good to see the actual partnership to how much care and attention uh, the Bristol Zoo team put into their surveys and they even named each crayfish. So that was really sweet. And the great thing about this piece of work is typically we think within the wild, about 20% of the juveniles will make it to one year of age. Whereas by doing it this way, we think over 80% of the juveniles will make it to one year of age. So we have a huge increase in the number of crayfish that are surviving. And so the real valuable thing about having this increased survivorship is that we can return those adults back to the location we collected them. And then we've got this huge number of juveniles that we can either release into an arc site or to supplement the river population as we've been doing for the last 10 years. And so actually we're having a very limited impact on that donor population, whereas we're having a fantastic increased value for our work either at that ARC site or that river supplementation location. The Southern Chalk Stream Project is a partnership project working with the Bristol Zoological Society, the Environment Agency, Natural England 
and has been funded for a number of years by a range of partners, including the Environment Agency in Naturalingen, but also the Vitacrest Conservation Trust. And it's absolutely crucial to have that range of partners bringing in their expertise, skills, allowing us to really deliver fantastic conservation for white claw crayfish. But what's critical to understand is apart from the recent discovery of white claw crayfish at our Winnable Moors Nature Reserve, where they were discovered last year for the first time in 30 years, actually the majority of the work has been delivered on private land. So private landowners are a crucial partner for the Southern Chalkstream project and absolutely without their support we wouldn't be able to deliver a wide range of the conservation measures we've delivered over the last 15 years. Yeah, it's a brilliant project and it's been something going for 15 years, but we are uh, national leaders in chalk stream uh, and crayfish expertise now, which is brilliant. It's fun day, Megan, isn't it? It's really good. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm now going to introduce um, Aggie Thompson, who works in our ecology team, uh, and she's going to tell us a bit more about our nature-based solutions work on the Isle of Wight, particularly but also how important it is that we do all the monitoring and the evidence collection to show just how much uh, it's really working to bring nature back. So, Aggie, over to you. Hello, my name is Aggie Thompson and I'm a Nature-Based Solutions Officer at the Trust and I'll be talking to you this morning about rewilding and Nature-Based Solutions as tools for nature's recovery. So first of all, what are nature-based solutions? They are a series of mechanisms for solving the issues faced by the environment and society using natural solutions, with their aim to restore ecosystems, supporting biodiversity and addressing challenges that we face, such as climate change, biodiversity loss, risks to human health, natural disasters and water pollution. And this last one is a really key uh, issue that we're addressing at the Trust, you've heard earlier in the talks this morning, uh, through our nitrate reduction program. So the issue that we're facing uh, is excess nutrients in the solvent, which have been released there through agricultural runoff uh, and wastewater pollution, which has led to a nutrient imbalance and the process of eutrophication. And as you can see in this picture here on the right, uh, we get the formation of these dense algal mats, which smother everything underneath, leading to ecosystem collapse. In the bottom right, uh, we've got a nutrient test result from one of our rewilding sites, Wild and Unwell. And as you can see, the test kit is maxed out with the level of nitrates in the ditches there. So this is a result of um, the uh, nutrient-rich fertilisers that have been previously applied to that land before the trust took it over. Uh, and all of these nutrients then leaching into the ditches and then ultimately into the solar and exacerbating the problem. So the way that we are proposing and currently addressing the issue is through land use change projects. Uh, and these are essentially returning low-grade agricultural land to natural habitat. So this can lead to a reduction in the nutrient release into the sediment. So we're directly stopping uh, adding those fertilizers to the land. We're no longer applying pesticides and chemicals, which obviously has other benefits. We're increasing the habitat available for wildlife improving landscape connectivity as you can see in the map here uh, this is a zoomed in version of the animation that debbie showed a minute ago so we've got wild the ducks more and wild and unwell uh, shown here are two rewilding sites and then the green is um the rest of the trust reserve uh, uh, state um, so you can see we're starting to get really real connectivity in this part of the island and um, we can also look at providing opportunities for nature-friendly farming which we're doing at wild and unwell with the normal home farm So what is rewilding? It is the large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature is allowed to take care of itself. So the aim is to really reinstate the natural processes and the ecological function, function of a site, creating really resilient habitats that will stand up to climate change. And we do this whilst being led by nature. So it's not a prescriptive approach. Uh, we're listening to what the sites are doing, how they're changing, and we're supporting them by appropriate and sensitive management. A really important part of this is ecological monitoring. So we do this through a series of wildlife and environmental surveys with a focus on bioindicator species. So these species are really sensitive to their environment and respond really quickly to change. 
and we make sure that we're collecting high quality quantitative data which helps us to evidence the progress on the sites and inform management and also feed into the wider um, results of, of the success of rewilding. So the groups that we focus on are birds, bats and invertebrates because these are really good bioindicator species. They are really sensitive to environmental change, they can tell us about habitat quality, the availability of resources on a site, how well the landscape is connected and how well the ecosystem is functioning. And what we want to achieve are more complex and heterogeneous landscapes because these support a higher species diversity which in turn provides more complex ecological processes, feeding back into the improved ecosystem function and the increased resilience of our sites. And then obviously making it much more resilient uh, in the face of challenges such as climate change. We also carry out environmental assessments, which can inform us about the habitats that we have. Uh, it can tell us about the impact of management, such as grazing, about the soil condition and about the soil and water nutrient content as well, which is really key in our projects. So the first site that we acquired was Wilder Little Ducks Moor in 2020, uh, and we are now, uh, we've just completed the summer surveys of year three, so we're really starting to see some trends coming out of the site and some really exciting results. We've already recorded 51 bird species at Ducks Moor, with 14 of these being new uh, since the baseline survey during the breeding bird surveys. We've had increased activity of two bat species and four biodiversity action plan species recorded as well. And we've had 26 butterfly species, slight increase from the slide that was shown earlier because we've got some more up-to-date data. Um, and this includes some calcareous specialists as well. And eight of these species have been new since the baseline survey. <laughs> And this is a visual representation of how the site is changing. So the top row uh, are images of Ducksmoor in 2021, um, about a year or so after we took the site on. So you can see it started to change from when it was an arable farm already. Uh, but the real change can be seen two years later. So earlier this year, we've got uh, much more floristic cover on the site. So providing those nectar sources for invertebrates and in other areas of the site as well, we've had some scrubbing out of the hedgerows. Uh, leading us towards that nice jigsaw of different habitats that will increase species diversity in time. Our second rewilding site is Wild and Nunwell, uh, and we released this last year in 2022. And we've just completed the second year of summer surveys, so we're starting to draw some initial comparisons. So we've already had some really, really exciting results. Uh, we've had 65 bird species already, which is quite staggering. Um, 10 of these have been recorded uh, this year, so new species compared to last year. We've had 24 butterfly species uh, and we've had the butterfly activity hugely increase. So last year we were recording an average of 60 butterflies per survey and this year that's increased to 116 on average per survey, so almost doubled in the amount of butterfly activity that we've recorded there. We've also seen nine species of bumblebee, including the forest cuckoo, tree bumblebee and red-tailed cuckoo. And here is an even more striking uh, comparison of how our sites have changed. So this is none well uh, just after we acquired it compared to one year later. That's just one year's worth of difference there. And it's gone from a kind of luminous green landscape in the top to something that actually resembles a meadow. So we've had uh, the tougher species colonizing so far. Uh, and in time, the process of succession will continue whilst being supported by grazing. Another really important survey that we carry out is soil sampling. So we do this to help monitor the high nutrient levels in the soil, uh, which are present because of the previous agricultural use of the sites. Um, and this helps inform us about the suitability for habitat restoration. So we measure soil mineral nitrogen, other nutrients, including phosphorus, potassium, magnesium. We look at pH, organic matter content, and soil type as well. So a really comprehensive survey of our soils. And as mentioned a bit earlier, we've had a staggering result come out of Ducksmoor. So two years after carrying out the baseline survey, we've had a 47% decrease across the whole site in soil mineral nitrogen, which is a lot more than we were expecting. 
We've also had a 19.5%, at least a 19.5% decrease in every field. So the trend is uniform across the whole site. We've also had a decrease in phosphorus levels, so 6.4% decrease across the whole site. And this is a really key change in two of our fields uh, because on the most recent analysis, those fields were no longer considered to have phosphorus as a limiting factor for their restoration. So we really hope when we repeat the survey again in two years' time that this, will, uh, this trend will continue across the rest of the site as well. We've seen an increased pH in every field, which is uh, due to the reduced nitrate content because the soils are now less acidic. Uh, and this will improve the suitability for calcareous restoration. So our next steps are to continue our annual species surveys to record the trends and to make sure that we're getting really robust monitoring data out of our work. And this will help us to evidence the success of rewilding. We're also going to be working with the Zoological Society of London uh, using their platform Instant Wild, uh, which is basically where we can upload all of our trail camera footage from our sites and members of the public will be able to help us identify the wildlife on the sites. So we'll be able to understand more about the more sensitive species that are using the sites that you don't tend to see whilst walking around um, and also increase our engagement as well. And we're also looking into monitoring the health and wellbeing uh, impacts of rewilding. So not just focusing on the benefits for nature, but also the benefits for people. And all of this work is a contribution to our 30 by 30 goal. So the goal to see 30% of our land and sea to be connected and protected for nature's recovery by 2030. And it's also sparked the creation of the rewilding network, uh, again mentioned earlier. Um, so it's a dedicated network for rewilding and ecological regeneration, which we are leading. Um, and it's about connecting local large scale rewilders with the aim to raise the standard of rewilding in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight and to promote um, ecological monitoring. And it's all about shared learning, making sure everybody is sharing everything that they've learned while they're, while they're going on their individual journeys. Uh, we also are contributing to the Trust goal to see wildlife recovering over a third of land and sea and are engaging with local landowners and covering, encouraging positive action for wildlife through advocacy, communications and storytelling. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you have enjoyed learning about our nature based solutions and rewilding work and that you are as excited as we are to see where the projects take us in the future. Thank you, Aggie. I think it's absolutely astonishing and it just shows you, you give nature a bit of space, it will bounce back. It gives us massive hope for the future and it's really brilliant work. So thank you so much. Um, so now may I invite Hannah Terry to come and join us. Hannah is um, one of my directors. She works to lead our advocacy and engagement work. And we're going to talk a little bit about standing up for nature. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Hello everyone, it's lovely to be here and speak to you today. Um, I am the Director of Advocacy and Engagement for the Trust and today I'm going to talk particularly about the advocacy side of that and our work on kind of policy and campaigning. And it's brilliant to follow Aggie talking about the kind of leading and pioneering work that the Trust is doing on nature-based solutions. From my perspective, the amazing thing about that is that the impact isn't just felt on the ground and by nature directly but it's felt by the wider policy environment, locally and nationally. It's our superpower as a wildlife trust and as wildlife trust that we don't just stand and theoretically talk about what needs to be done in the policy environment, but we do, we, we develop, we deliver and we do, and then we use that expertise and that experience and that knowledge and the evidence to be able to show how it's done to other people and make sure that that's taken forward. Um, it's called Advocacy Through Action, or it's been called Advocacy Through Action, and it's a really important tool in our, in our kind of advocacy arsenal. And, um, and our, our firepower there, for our advocacy firepower, is really vital at the moment as we're pushing for you know, really strong commitments, action, um, and policy change. Uh, and, um, yeah, and, and so that we can reach our 2030 goals. On the policy front, it has been a bit of a rocky year this year, it's fair to say. Um, I feel like sometimes I'm on a bit of a roller coaster. I kind of swing from the excitement of being part of this amazing movement 
to feeling like absolute terror that it's all going to go off the rails. Um, I've been part of the trust and working in this field for about six and a half years. So that covers the period from the EU referendum to today. So you would have thought in that time I would have become a bit accustomed or inured to the ups and downs in politics. But this last 12 months, I think, has felt particularly intense. And I think the dips have been have hit really hard because it's followed a period of um, pr inching upwards and towards progress. You know, we had a 25-year environment plan. We had eventually an Environment Act. And all that came with promises of nature recovery networks and public money for public goods. And although none of that policy was perfect and we've been really busy pushing for kind of the detail and the implementation, we did feel like we were moving in the, in the right direction. And, and really, how could we not be when the public pressure feels more palpable by the day? When we launched Wilder 2030, we we're at the crest of kind of Fridays for, for Future. Um, and you could feel it. it was the highest polling for environmental concern that we'd seen. And that hasn't fallen away. But in the light of kind of wider global and economic and social storms, we have seen the political winds change in the last year. There's been a shift of tone. There have been delays, there have been dilutions, there have been discussions and um, there have been counter narratives from some quarters, as, as Debbie mentioned, particularly around things like food security. But no one, I think, was really prepared for the ideological chasm that opened up with the trust um, period. Um, we saw the retained EU law bill come onto the table, and um, that threatened in one fell swoop to get rid of decades of carefully designed protections. Uh, and it came with promises to industry to um, get rid of blockers to building, loosen the environmental uh, barriers in, in investment zones, and just to grow, grow, grow uh, at all costs. And you might ask why well, this is something that we as a wildlife trust locally in Hampshire and Isle of Wight need to worry about uh, it, when it is Westminster policy and, and uh, law that's at stake. But it's essential for us to be able to do our job. We need that really strong, positive um, policy environment to be able to achieve our, our goals. Um, and standing up for some of our most highly protected areas, like we've been doing for a number of years now at Tipner West, for example, becomes completely futile if those protections are then dispensed with. And our work to open up and create markets for nature-based solutions, for example, to be able to uh, obtain more land to rewild, that all um, is undermined if the confidence of investors and local authorities is, is shaken by shifting goalposts. And deregulation rather than better regulation just means that it opens the floodgate for, for more pollution, more um, inappropriate development it makes our job just get harder and harder. So um, the other point is that, as I said at the beginning, we know what works locally, so we need to make our presence felt. And we also know that our supporters and our members really care about these issues, so we need to help you, them, make their voices and their feelings known. So we responded to this attack on nature, and it's fair to say that I think this galvanised the environmental movement and organisations like never before. Um, and uh, we, you know, we came out really, really strongly, kind of whipping up a media storm and mobilising members. And thank you to every single person that wrote to their MP and made their feelings known. It really did make a difference. We also saw locally how committed and passionate communities can take a lead role in pushing for change. So Wilder Bramley, um, who is a, a Wilder community that we've worked with for a, a while now through a funded project with Basingstoke and Dean District Council, they took a lead. They um, stood up to challenge Renel Jaradina, the um, MP for North East Hampshire, when he was briefly the Secretary of State for the Environment. Um, 
the uh, played hosts with OSPB and us in the background, and they gathered together local concerned residents and groups to really show that people cared about the issues. And it was a small gathering. Chris Beckham came, which was great. Um, but it was mainly local residents, concerned residents and, and groups. And it was small, there was tea and there were scones. And it was, you know, as far as you can get from kind of glue and paint tactics that we've seen elsewhere. But it made a real difference and it made a real mark and showed that there is kind of polite but impassioned feeling in rural England about this. And in, in the, as a result of this kind of concerted campaigning that we saw this year, there were real like victories for sense. Um, the retained EU law bill lost some of its most damaging elements. So we haven't seen all of the EU law just disappear at the end of this, this year. Um, and the investment zones were just quietly reframed and nobody talks about them really very much. But during this period, we also saw some of our newer allies step forward um, and come out on the side of nature. So people like the Solent Freeport um, s stated that uh, they wouldn't ever take up financial incentive, fiscal incentives for growth if it was at the expense of the environment. So really welcome and strong statement. Um, and I think this is indicative of a wider reality. Actually, locally, the majority of businesses, the majority of public bodies, the, the majority of you know, organisations really understand that the economy needs to be greener and communities need to be greener, and they just want the support and the right policy environment to be able to get on with that transition and that shift. So it's part of our role at the Trust and part of my team's role working with others um, is to work with those actors and those decision makers to ensure that they know how to embed nature's recovery in their policy and practice at a local level. Um, our efforts now try and focus on that early intervention stage. So we really focus on things like local plans and um, strategies and policies so that we get the kind of bedrocks of, of, of action right. And this graphic here shows um, the range of local plans and strategies that we've fed into and hopefully improved in, uh, over the course of the year. And we also respond to individual specific developments where they are strategically significant, where they are either going to do um, significant damage to our own nature reserves and our own sites or other really important nature sites, or whether they were where they would set a um, dangerous or, or important precedent. And just looking at it, you can see how much effort goes into just defending our own nature reserves and protected sites when you would hope that they would be safe already. Um, we're also active participants in the Hampshire and Isle of Wight nature recover, um, Local Nature Partnership, um, which is a number of organisations and bodies, including regulators that come together. Um, and this year, in 20, well, last year, in 2022, we worked with the Hampshire um, Biodiversity Information Centre on behalf of the LMP and wrote and published the um, Natural Wealth, which is kind of sets out our natural capital assets. Um, we're also supporting councillors, uh, including through a, a series of webinars, so drawing on our expertise from our Nature-Based Solutions team to show them how to get ready for things like biodiversity net gain. Um, and as a trust now, we're invited to sit on panels like Solent Freeport, um, Business South, uh, Green Print, the Local Enterprise Partnership, all of those um, bodies, and to be part of that conversation about industry and economy and be the voice for nature in those discussions. So on to local nature recovery strategies, which are coming. Um, so in the, in the next year, we will be helping to shape the important local nature recovery strategies that are mandated by government for all um, councils to, to lead and develop um, for both Hampshire and for the island. And we'll be trying to make sure that the 
LNRS, as it's abbreviated to, sets out clearly how the counties will reach that 30 by 30 goal, as, as Debbie has spoken about earlier. Where that will be and what the mechanisms will be, and we'll be endeavouring to make sure that it's not just another document that sits on the shelf, but it's properly embedded in the decision-making processes of all of those local authorities and others that need to then deliver it. Um, and we're leading the community engagement for the LNRS in Hampshire. So building on our work with individuals and community groups across the county, we'll be getting people involved in that process. And I really hope to see a lot of you in the room feeding into that process over the next few months. So more detail will be coming out about, about that. Um, returning briefly to the national policy picture, so we survived the Truss era with a few like battle scars um, and the leadership changed, but unfortunately the anti has been upped in recent months as people have inevitably or parties have inevitably moved on to pre-general election footing and the environment has become a bit of a divisive issue with the parties grappling now to, to work out whose side and what side they need to be on. This is particularly stark when it's come to pitting environmental protections against uh, the need for new homes. This is where the battleground has been. And as many of you will know, the neutral neutrality rules that were put in place and you know we have led on the work with to, to, to make sure that housing development didn't further pollute our rivers and seas, were up for the scrap heap, as was well the really important polluter pays principle. Um, and again, we pushed back hard on this and we've gained ground. And this was helped, I think, particularly by the fact that there is, a, you know, as you'll know, a huge wave of public outrage against the state of our rivers and seas um, that has grown over the last few years. So in some ways, I think they picked the wrong battle with, with nature on this front. But we go back to the beginning, it was our ability to show that we we're already delivering uh, nutrient neutrality, that it works for local authorities, it works for um, builders, it works for nature, that was really instrumental in the debates. Our scheme was used in media, in briefings, in, you know, in discussions, and really it was our work that made sure that the government's proposals on this were defeated in the, in the Lords. But unfortunately, the race to be seen as the, the party that builds for Britain is still very much front and centre. We've seen in the last week um, Labour talking about bulldozing through barriers to building. Um, and we know that the government is still trying to come up with ways of getting round the environmental protections to unlock new, more housing. Um, so it's still a very live issue. And it's been and it will continue to be a bit of a, a roller coaster, um, a big dipper. But it has actually remind, uh, kind of served to remind us of a few things the last year. One, that um, the environmental NGOs, the environmental charities, can be really powerful when they come together and um, stand in unity. And um, when we mobilise our members, and we've got collectively 20 million members, which is you know, a third of the population, and that is incredibly powerful. Um, and we, we can bring more and more people on board and we can create the momentum that is needed to push for those positive changes and to stand up against the, the um, negative policy plans. That we need people and organisations in all, of all types and shapes to be, to be doing that together. And people will have different ways of going about that and different MOs. And we might not agree with some of the tactics that are used, but it is really important that um, we stand together and we stand in unity on that. For us as a trust, individual, like as, a, as an organization, I think our role in pushing for change is threefold. One, as I've said, it needs to show our expertise, to show the evidence and to show what, what can be done and how it can be done. Secondly, it's to convene, it's to um, partner and work with others to get things done and then to inspire other people to do the same and to go further. And then finally, it's to empower um, people to take action is to enable individuals to act and to stand up and to use their voice and be heard because that is so 
important and persuasive in making sure that the right decisions are taken. We need to provide a channel um, for the hope, for the anger, for the frustration and turn it into something joyful and joyous to be part of. So we've, we've um, opened up a programme of campaign leaders. Uh, this is for people that want to take action in this way. We've got lots of other roles that people can take as well, from wildlife gardening champions to community leaders, etc. And um, the campaign leaders is for people that want to really use their voice. And it might be that they want to challenge individual um, developments or proposals in their specific area. We offer the training, the support, the advice, and we connect people together. We network people so that they can share what works and what doesn't and learn from each other. Um, and that might also be about supporting trust-led national or local campaigns as well. So if you're interested, let me know. The, f um, the most recent campaign, trust-led campaign that we launched is Save Our Chalk Streams, which we launched a couple of weeks ago with Megan's help. Um, we're calling for, we're asking people to contact their MPs at this stage to call for legal, uh, higher legal protections for our chalk streams. We know they are, as we've heard and we've seen from the video, our most precious, you know, cherished habitat. And even um, rivers, chalk streams like the Itchen, that have the highest level of protection afforded to them that you can get, are still struggling, they're still under pressure and they need better protection um, and more, more action. So we're building on the work that we've been doing for 15 years, we're building on the work of the Watercress and Winterbournes um, project, and we're working with lots of other experts in the field of, of rivers. Um, we're also uh, building on the work that was done by the Cabba Chalk Stream strategy in calling for this legal protection, because it is felt that this is the thing that will drive the necessary level of investment, the necessarily necessary you know level of protection from the damaging activities and, and developments. Maria Miller MP for Basingstoke is hosting a parliamentary roundtable in about ten days' time um, on our behalf, and we're asking you at the moment to get in contact with your MP to make sure that they show up and champion chalk streams. Um, so there is a simple form that you can fill in that will reach your MP. I know that some of you have already done that, so thank you very much if you have. And, and if you haven't, please please do. The more emails that they get saying, go to this thing, hopefully the more likely they are to, to turn up. Um, and beyond chalk streams, in the next year or so, and in the run-up to the general election, um, we will be seeking clear and strong commitments in the party manifestos. That's something that WCL, the Wildlife and Countryside Link, and um, the Wildlife Trusts are pushing for specific things that they want to see in the manifestos, and that's still to play for at the moment. And locally, we will be looking for those commitments locally from our MPs and, and candidates. And we'll be making these types of priorities specific to those local areas so they resonate with those, those candidates. Um, we'll be trying to make sure that as many people as possible are standing up for nature on their doorstep and that they're voting for, with nature in mind. It is really imperative now that the election issue next year is nature's recovery and a greener and wilder future for our communities and we will be calling on all of your help with that so thank you very much i'd like to close with a, a few thanks firstly i'd like to thank my fellow trustees for working very closely with the executive to bring about the right level of governance. It's been a real privilege and pleasure and honour, as always, to work with Debbie and her team and with my fellow trustees. So my profound thanks to both of those. Thanks also to the staff. I hope that today's presentations have made you proud of the organisation of which we are all part. It certainly uh, has and does to me. I'd like to thank the people who've organised today's meeting. Uh, you can imagine a huge amount goes on behind the scenes uh, to make uh, it all work seamlessly. And certainly from my perspective, 
uh, it has uh, been exactly that. Um, and I'd like to finish by thanking uh, all of you who are present here today. Every year I say, this is an essential part of our governance calendar. It's absolutely crucial that we fulfill this role. And without your attendance, we simply couldn't do it. So thank you very much indeed for that in isolation. But thank you also for everything that you do for the trust, with the trust, and on behalf of wildlife, at what is undoubtedly a time when wildlife and the environment needs us more than any other time in history. Thank you very much indeed. Meeting is now closed. Have a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.